on the Chromecast. Check it out. I'm Sam Major, Commercial Director for Chrome Technologies. And I'm joined today, by the first time, by Mr Paul Carey, Senior Technical Consultant. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sam. No problem at all. Um, today we're talking about the evolution uh, of the modern desktop, uh, and specifically around uh, AVD, Azure Virtual Desktop. Um, and obviously that's something I know you've got a lot of experience going back to kind of Citrix, and, and obviously now people are kind of this migration to, to AVD. Uh, and it'd be great today to kind of if you talk to our audience or I guess, um, A, what is it? Let's go through some of the basics. You know, what is a, a virtual machine? Uh, some of the advantages of AVD over some of the competition and why people we're seeing this migration away from you know, systems like Citrix into AVD. And then I guess some of the, the more interesting stuff that I've discovered as we work on this, the fact that we can now almost uh, you know, have a Windows desktop on any device should you choose to. And I guess there's also some potential security concerns around some of that. But if we go into, I guess, to, to rewind on all of that and go in at the beginning, I guess, so you know, what is what is AVD? So AVD is an, uh, it's an Azure virtual desktop environment. So it's a new environment which Microsoft have released and uh, are allowing people to connect up to Windows 10 machines within their um, environment. Uh, you use it to, to connect up to resources that are published to you in a secure and controlled manner. Mm -hmm. um, the, the desktops are, are created by IT, the, the IT department, and the, the, the number of application, applications available to users can be restricted and limited, mm -hmm. uh, depending on uh, the user's group that they belong to, or depending on user access rights and permissions. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, it's secured um, by default, so access is through uh, a hosted, uh, Microsoft hosted, platform allowing connections through uh, a web application gateway which they look, look after. Okay, how's that different from, you know, uh, again, treat me as a bit of a Luddite on this, I know I know a bit, but obviously no one there in your realm. So we've got kind of a, what I'd be used to, the fat client environment and kind of the access we have around that with kind of AD and, and OUs and all that sort of stuff. Is it a direct replica of that with Azure or is there kind of more to it? So it's, um, it's moving the, the Windows workstations with people's with users' data on them and applications on them out of their physical environment up mm -hmm. into the Azure's cloud environment. Yep. Uh, the applications will remain the same. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're restricted as to what people have access to. Mm -hmm. um, it's much more controlled and it's easier to prevent data loss through the Azure virtual desktop. So hang on, that's, that's an interesting point because a lot of the things we've talked about, especially on recent podcasts have been around kind of ransomware and data loss and strong passwords and all the sort of standard stuff that we know is important. So it would be good to understand, I guess, how by using uh, things like AVD, do we, are we able to enhance that security? So within AVD, you can, you can stop people from extracting data, pulling data out of mm -hmm. their, their uh, connection into the virtual desktop. Um, we can stop people accessing USB drives, printers, okay. um, I guess local file drive. Yeah, I'm saying it's quite important because the whole point of them being on the, the virtual desktop is is the work work from anywhere piece. So obviously, yeah. if you've got a, a, a machine in an office, uh, there's obviously a physical control you put over it, but obviously there's the eyes on it. But if I'm working from anywhere, yeah, uh, you kind of need that extra layer of security. Yeah, of course. So if, if, if you're working from home, then um, you, you can you plug in any computer. You can plug in your home computer to use it. Mm -hmm. Connect up via that and access. Um, across a secure connection, um, with the IT being able to restrict the number of resources that you can pull data through to get back to your own computer. So, so just think about that, because obviously, um, kind of pandemic, all that sort of stuff, we saw a lot of uh, remote work increased exponentially, but BYOD, yeah. uh, obviously people using their own devices. What considerations do we have to, to think about? So if someone is using their own device, and obviously we talked about this kind of off camera, the fact that you could, you, know, you can use an iPad, you could use your mobile phone. I'm not sure you want to use a, a Windows yeah, desktop on a mobile phone, but you could. Um, but you know, it, it's giving people this this capability to use that that work desktop, I guess, from anywhere. But are there any considerations around the, uh, I guess, the basic um, system requirements and that sort of stuff to actually make it work properly, or does it not matter because we're leveraging the cloud? So yeah, the Microsoft Im implementation have, have removed a lot of the infrastructure management service that required uh, to, to get a desktop published to you. Mm -hmm. um, the, 
typically in an RDS environment or Citrix environment, there's, an, there's a very many infrastructure servers that are required mm -hmm. uh, to get this to work. Um, Microsoft take all that away. Okay. And everything is, is managed by Microsoft. They're using the Microsoft Authenticator app or text messages they can send you, conditional based access, which is all inherent into the Microsoft platform. Um, it's used wild, widely through, mm -hmm. throughout many different services. Many, many applications use it that aren't within Azure, so the authentication so process it's part is of that, that natural it's Microsoft ecosystem. It is, and the, the benefits of that are well trodden, well used by, by multiple different applications. Um, both within Azure and outside of Azure. Mm -hmm. um, the authenticator, authenticator application is, is used to secure many different environments. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we talk obviously the security piece again, so I assume we're talking things like MFA and that sort of thing to actually access the information. Yeah, so the MFA can comprise multiple forms within the authentication process. You can receive text messages, mm -hmm. use the authenticator app on your phone, and you can look at source IP addresses and access tokens to base them if you've accessed them in the past or not. Okay. Uh, you may or may not get prompted if you're coming from a secure location. Um, depends how you want to configure it. Okay, so it's very flexible. And I was about to say, and that's all part of, the, of guess, the considerations you have to give when you're when you're designing something like this and you're configuring something like this for a customer. That's part of the investigation, I guess, is looking at where people will work. Uh, I guess the parameters of that, the permissions they all need to have. They're all considerations we've got to have from day one. Yeah. So, so um, access can be can be constrained to however you'd like it. Mm. So there's, there's very little that would, would get through it if you configured it in a great way. Yeah, I, mean, I guess it's really important if you've got, I don't know, it could be HR for instance, you only want them to look at certain stuff here, but not necessarily over there, and all that sort of thing, so having that, that ultimate level of control. And then I think the other thing that I was thinking of, and again, we talked about some of this off camera, uh, and, and it's quite enlightening, but it, it kind of made my brain ping, if you like, was just the ease of scalability. You know, we've seen before where we've done obviously some lots of large scale, uh, let's call it traditional fat client rollouts. Uh, you know, that's quite a bit of literary heavy lifting. Uh, yeah. And there's also a lot of on-site infrastructure to support all of that. And it's just, I guess, the, the ease of actually spinning stuff up like AVD uh, uh, to get out to multiple users, you know, very rapidly. Yeah, so it's all infrastructure as code. So you can write and develop your, your solution depending on um, have you write the, the, the scripts that you can pass up to, to Visual. The machines can be built on, on the fly almost. Mm -hmm. uh, additional machines added into a pool as you require. Mm -hmm. So you, you typically you'd build up a, a, a golden image, uh, put your applications into that, so then you place it into a shared image gallery within Azure. And from that you, you create uh, the, the workstations that users would connect onto. And the workstations can, can be Windows 10, can be mm -hmm. Server 2016, 2019 as you like. Yep. Uh, as in a traditional on-premise environment. Um, multiple users could, could log on to the same Windows 10 Enterprise machine uh, if they wanted to. And, and I think that was an interesting point we discussed as well. It, it is, it, it, in my head, kind of the it, it, old VDI world, it was almost like a one-to-one, -one. this is my virtual desktop, my profile, yeah. and actually with, with AVD it can be quite different. You can have that shared resource, and I guess from a commercial perspective, that makes sense. Yeah. So you reduce the, the CPU and RAM overheads and the, yeah. the cost that you'd be incurred by using that. And um, yeah. we've had multiple users logging onto the same Windows 10 machine. Yeah, do you have to, I guess, do you have to throttle what people can have or does it allow you to burst if you get someone doing I mean, something particularly resource intensive? Does it allow you to do that or, or how do you manage that? Well, on a per user basis, it's hard to increase CPUs and memory on, on the fly, uh, but on then subsequent connections, it's we could divert them onto a higher resource machine. So does it allow you to, to burst and I guess allocate more resources required or we can find or how do we manage that? And, and I think actually specifically thinking about uh, intensive applications where people with CAD design and all that sort of stuff, how do we manage that within AVD? So for users with intensive applications, we'd look to provision desktops with, with more RAM, more CPU, more resource, more IOPS available to them. And they would have a, a richer and um, experience when they, when they come to use that then. We, we can dedicate these machines to specific groups of users um, depending on a part departmental basis. Mm -hmm. So users would be able to access in with a higher aspect desktop for them. Uh, applications installed by IT, Some CADs could even be used up there if you wanted to. The, mm -hmm. the protocol, RDS protocols, strong enough to allow that to, to pass through. 
So does that, I mean, again, Actually, going back to the, just thinking about the, uh, just in the laptop side of there makes me think, again, we're talking about CAD, uh, and obviously we do this on the cloud, so we really can do, I guess, high uh, intense applications, all that sort of stuff on something as simple as a you know, micro PC or, or an iPad. Yeah. You know, so is that really feasible? You could do, yeah. So you could run a, a machine in Azure with 32 CPUs and terabyte RAM and have it connected on your phone and you still get the same amount of resource within the cloud available to you so you can you know it's gonna be impossible to use it on a phone yeah. but, um, someone will try yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, some, some, but you could use it on an iPad if you want to like iPad Pro the larger screen you can get keyboards you can get a Bluetooth mouse available for it so you, you could theoretically run Microsoft applications within Azure on iOS devices or Android devices and is it, is it a persistent experience? I'm thinking of my prior knowledge of things like Citrix. Obviously, I could be working on my CAD design, whatever it is, on my iPad, you know, yeah. on, the, on the train or home, whatever it is. I come into the office and I've got exactly the same thing going on. It is dependent on your, your network connection, your mm -hmm. internet connection. Um, if, if you're on a train, you, you might get lucky. Yeah. Um, you might be able to, to use the train's um, inbuilt GSM system to connect out, 3G, 4G. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if, typically it wouldn't be great on the train. You, you'd want if, to I, if I lost my connection, let's say, uh, and then I come into the office, can I log back into that? You can do yes. The system. The session stored. It's, it's yeah. on a, on a, the desktop that you're connected to within Azure. And um, when you come to reconnect to it, everything will be exactly where you left it. So you'll be able to connect back in and just carry on as you're working. Brilliant. So, so no excuses. Yeah, no excuses. <laughs> okay. The tunnels. Yeah, of course. Um, just thinking then, obviously, you know, we can mention some other vendors because people will be aware of the likes of you know, Citrix and VMware Horizon, all this sort of stuff. Um, I, I'll ask you your direct opinion as to why, you know, why would you recommend someone goes for, for AVD over the more traditional Citrix, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, so, so AVD is a comparable product to Citrix virtual apps and virtual desktop, and remote desktop services and VMware View. So it's doing the same function. Mm -hmm. um, the, the management overhead of all the other applications out there, VMware View, Citrix, mm -hmm. RDS, they're, they're, they're all taken on, they're all owned by Microsoft's service. Okay. So maintaining those servers, maintaining the security around those servers and services um, is, is controlled by Microsoft. Yeah, so it's so one less thing to worry about. It's about to say, so you kind of, you, you, you're outsourcing that essentially. Yeah. It's the same experience, same concept, but without that, overhead of managing it internally so I guess you're freeing up your internal resource to do let's call it more interesting things yeah so the, instead of you know in the past maintaining Citrix environments VMA view environments be maintaining the management servers more yeah. often than the gold image um, we've seen some big Citrix environments in the past and we know yeah. that how intense they can be just to keep, keep yeah. the lights on yeah but moving to AVD you, your, your focus is more on the the images so yeah. what you're providing the, the gold image and you're able to spend a lot more time crafting that into such a way that it's um, that gives what, a better experience. I think it's, let's focus on that because I think that's um, again an interesting point around kind of how we is there any difference or, or not around the packaging part. So obviously we have to package applications to publish them in AVD. Um, what sort of tool set or tooling do Microsoft give us to do that? Is it any easier than the more traditional route, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Yes, yeah, so it's within um, within Microsoft's environment. You, you can code everything, you, everything is done by code, that they, you know, they love it, it's there, it's what they want everyone to use. Um, we, we can create desktops via PowerShell mm -hmm. into Azure, we, we can have applications installed onto them uh, via PowerShell as well, via multiple methods, um, it could be group policies, mm -hmm. it could be chocolatey um, repositories, yeah. uh, it, it, it can come from multiple different areas, SCCM. And you, you'd use these applications to, to push the applications for users onto the desktop. Mm -hmm. um, from here, that you, you'd create a gold image. Um, you can do all this by all this by code. You, you create a gold image. The gold image you can then spawn out into host machines that users connect into. So that's that. I guess the uh, the, the ease of the proliferation. So if we have yeah. to suddenly push out a, a hundred, a thousand. Etc. Desktops. Yeah, it is that easy. Yeah, and users we can set it up so users log on to a single machine which they control. Mm -hmm. They can make changes to that machine. They can install their own applications onto it, and they'll they'll persist each time they, they log back into it. Okay. Uh, typically, m most people for most users, mm -hmm. um, they log on to a machine that gets rebooted each night, and all the changes are lost. 
Yep. Um, and it's a much more controlled configuration in, 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 in that fashion. Um, I think IT like it because users can't go off and destroy things and install their own <laughs> software and yep. move on. Um, yes, uh, yeah, much more controlled. Okay. Yep. So, yeah, and, and, and another benefit of, of Windows 10 and F, uh, that Microsoft had just released or relatively recently released, uh, they bought out a company called FS Logics. Okay. Um, it's, it's a free product for, for use if you have a, an RDS license um, or a Microsoft Virtual Desktop license. And um, with, with this, you, it controls multiple things. Mm -hmm. um, the greatest benefit is the profile container. Um, it's an office container where logging on to, to your virtual machine, all your profile data is redirected to a virtual hard drive, okay. which can be in Azure storage, or it could be on a, a file server somewhere, an SMB share. Mm -hmm. um, benefit of this is the users will be able to, to log on immediately. Um, they're, they're, they're not waiting for profile data to be downloaded from a server. Mm -hmm. um, the, the VHD file, the virtual hard drive file containing their profile is, is mapped straight into the virtual desktop. And any accesses to profile data are immediately over a network connection to the VHD file. So very quick logons, very yeah. it's able to persist much more data than in the past and yeah. alternative solutions that Citrix and Microsoft have attempted. Yeah, um, so it's a much nicer overall user experience. Yeah, and it re removes an awful lot of profile bloats that you can get. Yeah. And it's, users prefer that in, in our experience to the, the massive amounts of log on times that we that you can see. Yeah. Can see. Mm. Okay. So I guess, and I will ask the question because obviously what we're doing here is we're kind of, uh, we're back to the lyrical about the benefits of ABD and it, you know, it's the answer. It's panacea to everything. Um, clearly that isn't the case. There is, there is still uh, you know, a reason to have a fat client environment, but I guess in your opinion, you know, where is that? Where do you say, you know what, if you do this, you should definitely be ABD, and potentially, uh, actually, if you're doing that, you should still be fat client, or, or am I completely wrong, and the world should be ABD? Yes, it's, um, the biggest selling point for ABD is security, okay. because it gives you, you are able to control all of your data and all of your accesses to that data um, in a much more controlled manner than with fat clients. Mm. So laptops, desktops. Uh, if you if you want to control access to applications that your business um, provides, um, a AVD will allow that. Mm -hmm. um, large desktops, they're, they're they're beneficial for the fatter applications. The, some there's applications which are heavily three D dependent. Yeah. Um, but it's not it's not to say you can't run. Just, just need an awful lot of, uh, of resource in the cloud to do it. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, the, 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 there are benefits to local desktops for people who are roaming out that's about. You might not have an internet connection. Uh, so I thought about to say and think about it actually. I can see that you know the way five you know, G is pushing out and give it another five years. I suspect we'll all be hive mind connected somehow anyway. But you know the problem of actually not having an internet connection anywhere will probably not be a thing. And I guess at that point that's probably the death of fat client at that point. Yeah, you could, yeah, you could see that, yeah. yeah. And actually going on that, obviously all being connected one day, but as we are today, uh, I was thinking about, we deal with some very big customers and there's some very big implementations uh, of AVD essentially that are global. And obviously you have different Azure tenants in different regions. How does, how does that work with AVD? So there's one entry point into the Azure Virtual Desktop environment from the, the internet. Um, that entry point is the same no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. So you can be in Australia, you're still accessing the same URL to connect in um, as you are in, in the UK. Um, if you access from Australia, you can be directed onto a, a desktop within Australia or the Australian region. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're accessing from the UK, you can access the same URL and be directed to a desktop in the UK. And, Benefits of that is the obviously the lower latency to, to the connection, um, which gives a better, smoother experience for users. But all that is controlled and access controlled and directed to the, the nearest desktop. That's that's all managed by Microsoft. Okay. Um, we can we can spin up VMs in a region wherever we like, and it's very easy to, to do that um, just by changing your, your code that you're, you're passing up to Azure uh, to provision the desktops with. Um, the con connections and load balancing across the internet is all, it's all managed by Microsoft. The, the big thing I'm taking away from this is, is simplicity. 
it all seems to be the fact that we can push a lot of this to Microsoft to take care of and actually seems to be very, very, very simple. Um, so I kind of I think I know it's going to come back my way, but I'm going to hit you with it anyway as I often do on the podcast. It's kind of the top three things, but I guess I'll ask you. You know, what are your, in your opinion, the kind of the top three reasons why someone should look at AVD? So easy to scale. Mm-hmm. You can scale out as quickly as you like, as slow as like as much as you like. Uh, you can power off the VMs o- overnight and you can save money that way if they're not used, power them on to, you know, as, as you need to. So scalability is there. Mm-hmm. Security is, is the second most important one. Um, so you can retain your data and retain access to your data. You can control who has access to this environment in a, in, in using Microsoft's controls to, to do that. Mm-hmm. The third one is the IT can really control what people do and you can control what people have access to and you can control the, the user environment experience so a lot better. You lock down people like me doing silly things and yeah, damaging yeah, especially you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and on that note, I think I'll end it. But thank you, Paul. It's really interesting. And um, again, I usually learn quite a lot from these podcasts, but today I think I've learned quite a bit, so thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. No and thank you for joining us on this edition of Chromecast. Uh, if there's anything you'd like to cover in future episodes, please do leave that in the comment section and make a like, comment and share, and join us again on Chromecast. Take it out. <laughs>